Okay, this morning we're going to take a look at um, some of the attributes of God. Um, there's, we're going to take a look at four of God's attributes. In other words, what he says about himself and his word. Um, when I was researching this, I found that there's some 15. There's probably more than that. But I saw I found that there was somewhere around 15 um, attributes that, you know, preachers preach about. Uh, we'll just look at four this morning. Um, the ones that we're going to look at this morning um, are uh, the aseity of God or um, the fact that God is self-existent, that he doesn't he doesn't derive anything, um, any power or anything from anyone else other than himself. Um, that's the aseity of God. The second one is going to be the omnipotence of God, and that's uh, the fact that God is all powerful or that his power is without limits. Um, the third one is going to be God's omniscience. So it's just three this morning the aseity of God, the omnipotence of God, and the omniscience of God. And the omniscience of God is the fact that God is all knowing or that he knows all things. So, and so the question uh, probably comes to mind, why, um, why look at these attributes of God? Why study these attributes of God? Um, and so if we understand something more of the character of God, who he is, um, his attributes, um, this will give us a higher view of God. This will help us to worship God in a more uh, proper way. This should bring about humility in the life of a believer. Um, we really just also need to understand how small we are and how big he is. Um, it'll also help us understand his word. Um, when you are reading the word of God, um, no part of the word of God should be taken um, just in and of itself, it should be taken in light of what we see in other scripture. And if we understand something of the character of God, then looking at, um, and we keep those principles in mind when we're reading God's word, it should help us a lot more to understand that. Why did he do this? Why did he do that? Well, God's always existed. God's all, all powerful. God is all knowing. We understand those things when we're reading scripture, then it helps us to understand it a lot more. Um, and that will help us get closer to God. So let's look at the, let's look at the first one. God is self-existent. This is the aseity of God. And really we don't need to go any further. Um, if, if, if we only had Genesis one, one, then we could, um, this could really tell us something about the self-existence of God. Um, how many times have you read, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth? And then you just kind of keep going. You, you kind of read through the story. Um, but maybe you don't think any deeper about it or think anything else about it. But let's, let's, let's go back to this again. In the beginning, God. So it doesn't say God had a beginning. It says, in the beginning, God did something. What did he do? Well, he created the heavens and the earth. So there was no beginning for God. I don't pretend to understand that. Um, all of us had a beginning. And short of the Lord returning, um, it's very possible. Only the Lord knows. But it's very possible that all of us will have an end. Each day has a beginning. You get up, you get up at a certain time of the day. And at, at the end of the day, you go to bed. Um, the word of God has a beginning. It's in Genesis and then it ends in Revelation. So we understand in our finite human understanding that um, everything in the world and everything from a human perspective has a beginning and has an end. I can't wrap my brain around the fact that God has always existed in and of himself. It doesn't make sense to me from a human perspective. But I have to have faith. I have to believe what the scriptures tell me. So 
keep that in mind. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There was no spontaneous combustion. There was no there was no big bang, where everything just happened to explode, and then the earth came on the scene, and then you know we slowly evolved from you know a little uh, salamander in the mud. God created. It sounds ridiculous, but there's people believe that. If they don't believe in God, they have to believe in something else, right? So, so again, we're looking at the self-existence or the aseity of God. So let's look at, uh, let's turn to Exodus chapter three, and verse thirteen. Exodus chapter three, and verse thirteen. So Moses um, is talking to God. And in verse 13, it reads, Then Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am, he said. Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God furthermore said to Moses, thus you, you shall say to the sons of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And this is my memorial name to all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has appeared to me saying, I am indeed concerned about you and what has been done to you in Egypt. So this, this name that God uses to describe himself, I am, points to his self-existence and his eternality. I am, in other words, I am, I am being, I am existing. I'm the preeminent one. I've been, I've been here since before time and space started. Let's look at Revelation 1. Verse 8, Revelation 1, verse 8. So here we have our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, God the Son, the eternal Son of God, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come. So who is in the present, who was in eternity past, and who is to come in eternity future, the Almighty. And so you, you'll notice that in him even saying the Almighty, well, that, that points to his omnipotence or his all-powerful, um, his unlimited power. So it's important to understand that no one of these attributes does God have more than the other or apart from the other, but all of them work in concert with one another. Okay, the self-existence of God, God's omnipotence or the fact that he's all-powerful, God's omniscience or the fact that he is all-knowing and he knows everything. These all work together. And so you'll see them interwoven and intertwined uh, in scripture you know, as we go through. Let's look at Psalm 90, Psalm 90, verses 1 and 2. Psalm 90, verses 1 and 2. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations before the mountains were born or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Again, verse two, before the mountains were born or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So again, more examples of the, the self-existence and eternality of God. Let's look at Psalm 102, verse 24. Psalm 102, verse 24. Psalm 102, verses 24 to 27. I say, oh my God, do not take me away in the midst of my days. 
Your years are throughout all generations. Of old, you founded the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. Even they will perish, but you endure. And all of them will wear out like a garment. Like clothing, you will change them, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. You are the same, and your years will not come to an end. And then I want to look at Romans 11.33. Romans 11.33. This is one of my favorite scriptures in all the Bible. So Paul has just uh, finished talking about um, God's plan for Israel in the future. Um, and then he just breaks out into a doxology, you know, or a praise. And in Romans 11.33... The Apostle Paul writes, oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. And I like I like the king, what the King James says um, at the end of verse 33. It says that his ways are past finding out. So if God's ways are past finding out, um, let's think of anything that he didn't reveal to us in Scripture as being something unfathomable or his ways past finding out anything that's not revealed in scripture. Verse 34, for who has known the mind of the Lord or who became his counselor? Well, the answer is nobody, right? Or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again. Again, that's, that's nobody for from him and through him and to him are all things to him be the glory of forever amen so for from him and through him and to him are all things that speaks both of the self-existence of god and the omnipotence of god so again god doesn't derive anything from anybody else he's eternally self-existent and he holds all the power in his hand to him be the glory forever amen amen So the second one that I have this morning is that God is all powerful or omnipotent. God is all powerful or omnipotent. And again, let's, let's go back one more time to Genesis one, one. And let's just read that again. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God created the heavens and the earth. How did he do that? We know that he did it, but how did he do it? We don't know. We have to be okay with, with not knowing certain things. Let's look at chapter 2, verse 7. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And again, we're, we're, we're looking at the, the all-powerfulness of, of God or the omnipotence of God. Uh, Genesis, Genesis 2, 7. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. Read that again. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. Again, the omnipotence of God. How did he do it? In a, in a supernatural way. He did it, of course. Absolutely amazing. So... I wrote down a couple things, um, a couple things that that God did um, that showed and proved His uh, omnipotent omnipotence, or the fact that He's all powerful. Um, in the time of Noah, God sent a flood and He destroyed the earth, except for Noah, his wife, his sons, and their wives. God sent ten plagues on Egypt because Pharaoh refused to let his people go. In 2 Kings 19, God sent his angel to wipe out 185 soldiers from the Assyrian army because their king defied God. Let's look at Hebrews 11.3. Hebrews 11.3. Three. I don't know if you guys have these Bible tabs, but they sure are helpful, especially for a situation like this. 
because you can just you can just get to one place from one place to the next pretty quickly. Hebrews eleven three. By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. So let's also look at, let's turn to the beginning of Hebrews chapter one. And look at verse three. So the writer of Hebrews is writing about our Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, and he, that's Jesus, is the radiance of his glory. That's God's glory. And the exact representation of his nature. So we get, we, we get a little bit of insight here again that these attributes of God are equally distributed among God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It's not as though one has one and one has the other. They all have these attributes uh, equally. And he, Jesus, is the radiance of his, that's God's glory, in the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. Upholds all things by the word of his power. So again, we see that the unlimited power or the, or the omnipotence of God. And so uh, here, here's a, another question um, for, for the group. You think it's by chance that the whole universe doesn't go careening out of control? Not at all. It's by the word of the power of God that all things are upheld. And we see an example of that right here in Hebrews. So I want to look at another, um, one more example of the omnipotence of God. Um, so for all the examples that we looked at are, um, these are, these are things that God did that are of a physical nature. Okay. He, God sent a flood and destroyed the earth. God sent 10 plagues, um, on Egypt. God sent his angel to wipe out 185,000 soldiers. There's many more examples uh, in the scripture that, that we're all aware of. Um, but what about, what about something that God would do that, that's spiritual? Um, I think one of, the, one of the greatest examples and proofs of the omnipotence of God is in regeneration. And so what's regeneration? Regeneration is um, the wonderful act where God sends his Holy Spirit to change the heart of an unbeliever um, and to make that person a believer. Um, so let's, let's look at Titus chapter three, Titus chapter three. We'll start in verse three, Titus chapter three, verse three. So the apostle Paul writes, for we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hating one another. So what the Apostle Paul describes here, just in verse 3, is the unbelieving state, right? Foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy hateful and hating one another. Then let's look at verse four. But when the kindness of God, our savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us not on the basis of deeds, which we have done in righteousness. So not by works, in other words, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So Paul shows us what, what our lives looked like before, and then he explains a little bit of what, of what happens through regeneration. Again, this is something that, that does not happen apart from the Holy Spirit. Um, 
I can't make myself a Christian. I can't, um, I can't simply take up um, a certain set of beliefs and start acting right. I can, I can surely try to act moral. I can surely try to, uh, to adhere uh, to certain beliefs, but I can't change my heart. I can't cause myself to be born again. That's something that, that only God can do with this Holy Spirit. He can only do it in his time also. So, um, so the final um, attribute that we'll look at this morning here is the omniscience of God, the omniscience of God. And what that means is that God knows all things. There's, there's nothing that he doesn't know. There's nothing that's out of the realm of, his, of what's in his mind. Um, there's, no, there's no contingency plans or thoughts with God. Um, we know he doesn't learn anything. He doesn't arrive at anything new. He knows the beginning uh, from the end. Um, God, knows, God knows our thoughts. God knows our thoughts. So let's look at Psalms 139. Psalms 139. Psalms 139, 1 through 6. The heading here, um, coincidentally, is God's omnipresence and omniscience. And we won't really cover the omnipresence this morning, but that just means that God is, because God is a spirit, he's everywhere at once. Nothing is out of his sight. So again, you can kind of see how one attribute um, co coincides with the other. Psalm 139, verse 1. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain to it. So I think um, David summed up perfectly in verse six, how I feel about this entire subject. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain to it. You feel like that? Verse five looks an awful lot like salvation to me. Uh, where, where David writes, you have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. If God has laid his hand upon someone, um, that looks a lot like salvation to me. God knows everything that will happen through the end of the world. God knows everything that will happen through the end of the world. Let's take a look at Isaiah 46 for, for the proof of that. Isaiah 46. We'll look at verses 9 and 10. Verses uh, 9 and 10, Isaiah 46. Remember the former things long past. For I am God and there is no other. I am God, and there is no one like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times things which have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Let's look at the second part of verse 9. Um, where the prophet Isaiah writes, for I am God and there is no other. One God. There's one God. I am God and there is no one like me. So, um, I am not like God. And 
I don't think like God. I don't have the mind of God other than what, what I can read and learn from his word, from scripture. So it's really important to make that distinction between man and God. God is not a man. Let's look at Hebrews 4.13. Hebrews 4.13. Again, we're looking at the omniscience of God or the fact that God is all-knowing. Hebrews 4.13. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So nobody or nothing is hid is hidden from the sight of God. Let's let's go back to Isaiah chapter 40 verse 28. Isaiah Isaiah 40 verse 28. Isaiah 40 verse 28 reads, "Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. So we can we can see that um, the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is in, inscrutable. The everlasting God, that's the aseity of God or the self-existence of God. He's the creator of the ends of the earth. He doesn't become weary or tired. That's the omnipotence of God or the fact that God is all powerful. His understanding is inscrutable. That's the omniscience of God or the fact that God understands everything. There's nothing out of his understanding. All, all just in this one little verse. So let's, um, let's go ahead and finish up with Ephesians chapter one, starting in verse three. Ephesians chapter one. Starting in verse 3. Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 3. And we'll see something of um, all three of those attributes uh, in this scripture. So the Apostle Paul writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespass, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. In all wisdom and insight, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him. That's Jesus Christ, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times. That is the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on earth in him. So in other words, everything everywhere. Also, we have obtained an inheritance in him also we have an, obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all th things after the counsel of his own will. So I want to stop there for one second. It says that it's according to God's purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his own will. So it's not the counsel of anybody else's will. God doesn't need to ask somebody else for advice, how they feel about something. It's only after the counsel of his own will, which is a perfect will. To the end, that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. In him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. So I think in this Ephesians chapter one, 
we see the aseity or the self-existence of God on display because we see that um, God planned certain things before the foundation of the world. We see the omnipotence of God where God does these things um, with power that only he possesses, that only he could possess um, in the way of salvation. And then we see the omniscience of God where God is all-knowing. Again, doing things where only an all-knowing God could do. So, well, that that is what I have for this morning. So, if you want to go ahead and uh, open it up, we can uh, uh, praise God. Okay, um, uh, brother Lauren, uh, Eddie from Brazil. Good morning. Good morning for you. Good morning for you all. And uh, I want to thank. I want to thank you for the link you, um, Brother Ponce, uh, sent me about uh, your study uh, of salvation. I have been uh, watching it uh, thrice, and it's so good. And I'd like to have uh, this link of this study again, because um, I'm uh, in my kitchen preparing my meal, and the kids' meal also. And Amen. I'd Very like good. to watch it, watch it again, and uh, uh, more carefully, you know. And uh, thank you so much for your study. And I'm, as always, I'm I'm learning in many things. Me too. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. I'm glad to hear it. Praise God. Good morning, everyone. Yes, I really thank you so much for a great blessing. For me, uh, it was see Psalm number 19, verse 2, it was encouraging me. Before the mountain were born, or you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Our God is everlasting God. It is, uh, how to say, the eternity of God. And we see in his attribute, the attribute is the nature and essential characteristic of God, his character. It we see in the, the omnipotent God. We see omnipotent is, we say, God is power. The power of God is seen in his creation. He created in the beginning. He created out of nothing. He created heaven and the earth. It is that in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 is the beginning of creation. But our God's eternal God. Eternity. And <clears throat> thank you so much. Amen. Good to hear you, brother. Yeah, great study, uh, Brother Lauren. Um, I like that in Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. And then you said, how did he do it? I don't know. Um, I was in a, a Bible study on Genesis, and we could barely get off of that first verse because everyone had a theory of what was going on. And so it was like, went on for half an hour or so and you know finally i led him to that scripture in hebrews you know by faith we understand that this is what happened and uh, so yeah a lot of people get stuck on that um but if you don't believe that then the rest of the bible you might as well not read because that's that's the beginning and i've had some people say you know i don't well, i believe in evolution but you know i believe in jesus well if you believe in evolution, you, you can't read the Bible. You got to start here at the beginning that God created. And so, but yeah, like I said, that, you know, but I don't know how he did it. And we don't. We don't have to know everything. Um, but what I do know by faith, yeah, he did. So, yeah, great study. Praise God. As, as well, usual. You, um, one, one of the preachers that I like to listen to uh, Martin Lloyd Jones, who isn't with us anymore. Um, he has said in some of his sermons that um, having faith uh, means 
submitting yourself to the biblical limits and not mm. going outside that. And, and even so, sometimes you have to say, you just have to say, I don't know. Sure. I don't know the answer to that. If there, you know, what, what about um, the fact that God chooses people? The scripture tells us that he, he, he chose people before the foundation of the world, those, those that he would save. But then at the same time, if I don't believe um, the scripture tells me that I'm responsible. Well, those are, those are two biblical truths that I can't reconcile. I can't. So just like how he created the world. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Find out later. <laughs> well, I do think though, a uh, good, good, um, Appreciate all the sharing, Brother Lauren. You did a good job. Um, but I do think he does give us a hint scripturally if we look at verse 3. And it's in the first three words of verse 3 where we get a hint of how God did what he did. Do we understand it? No. Yeah. And it said, and God said, let there be light. So he spoke and yeah. bam, things happened. Now, I've spoken before and nothing happens like that, Okay. I mean, there's just no way. If I say, let there be light, there must be some kind of a Surrey app that pops on the light because it's not me happening. Yep. But I do think that verse gives us a hint because now how did he create man? Well, he said he formed him from the dust. But I've always gone back to verse three when it says, in the beginning, God created. And he created through his voice. Yep. And that's kind of a hint. I don't know if that's the exact way he did it, but he did do the light that way and the other things and so but again we're mere men trying to understand the ways of god yeah so but that's what i took when i was looking through the scriptures before but otherwise good 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 lesson appreciate the sharing that you amen and that you make a good point about him um doing it with his voice or speaking it in, into existence right and we looked at hebrews um, how it says that God holds upholds all things by the by the word of His power. So, John chapter one also says that um, everything was created through God the Son. That God the Father created everything through God the Son. So, uh, it is a great study, Lauren. Uh, there is so much to learn about God, and. Uh, I like what in the book of Romans, chapter 16, the dialogue, I can never pronounce that word, the ending, 25. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God. Focus in on those words. He is eternal. To bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God to glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. It's so wonderful to receive from the scriptures just who God is, because that's part of our Bible study. When we want to study the Bible, we want to get to know our creator, the one that has created everything that we can see, the heavens, all the fish. So I was thinking the other day when I was talking to my wife, how much time we spent knowing about each other before we entered into our relationship and if we are going to have a relationship with God we want to know and we want to serve him because he says you should have no other gods before me and he is the only one so thank you Lauren very good praise God thank you brother good to see you good to see you yeah, if we all turn to uh, John 17, Jesus is praying. John 17, 1, 2, and 3. 
And three is a key verse there. <clears throat> the Bible says that Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son also may glorify you. And you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. Verse three, and this is eternal life, that they know you the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. See, so what is eternal life? That we would know our God. You know, Brother Doyle said that we want to know our creator. You know, think about relationships. Last night, my daughter and I went to a, a dance in, um, in Oakdale. They have a daddy-daughter dance. And um, this is the fourth annual. And before that, we went to dinner and we started to get to know each other. You know, like, I, what's your favorite color? And she said her favorite color was red. She asked me my favorite color. I asked me about my favorite movie, you know, and things like that. We, we were just getting to know each other. And so that's what Jesus Christ is saying here, that we want to know our God. And today we learn, you know, that God is self-sufficient, that God is all powerful. And God knows all things. Why is it important to know these things? Because we want to serve our God. We want to serve him well. Um, you know, some people think, I don't know, things like these, like, like, like these kind of teachings will rough someone the wrong way. And if it does, they'll bring up people like the thief on the cross, you know? Well, he gave his life to Jesus. He went to heaven. Let me tell you, you and I are not the guy on the cross. We're not going to die in a few hours, Lord willing. So we, got, we have a lifetime to get to know our God, whatever life we have on earth. And let's get to know him and know him well. What does he like? What does he, what, what does he hate? For what? So that we won't do so that we will serve him, serve him well. You know, one fine, one more verse, uh, if I can share is it is in Second Samuel chapter 12, verse 12. And that goes along with the Hebrews passage that you shared about God knowing all things. You shared in Hebrews uh, chapter four, verse 13, that no creature is hidden from his sight and that all must give an account in Second Samuel. Let me get to it really quick. Second Samuel chapter 12. Second Samuel chapter 12, verse 12. So here King David um, is being rebuked by Nathan, the prophet, because of David's sin. David you know, in today's terms would be considered, you know, would be a Christian. So David, a Christian man, has sinned against the Lord. He had an affair. Um, he tried hiding the sin. You know, he ended up murdering the, the woman's husband, along with other men. Um, it's a ripple effect of sin. Not only did he kill these men, imagine their families, that they have wives, that they have children. Now these now you know, there's a whole ripple effect of, of, of damage that was happened that, that happened here, you know the lies and so anyways, Second um, Samuel twelve twelve, the prophet says to David, for you did it in secret, but I as in God, will do this thing before all Israel before the sun. See so whatever David did, he did it in secret, but God saw it. Because God is all knowing. And why do I bring this up? I bring this up as a warning so that maybe if, if we knew this or maybe if our children knew that God is all knowing and God sees all things, perhaps it would steer them away from a certain sin they want to commit. You know, perhaps they, perhaps it would steer them away. You know, this is the fear of God. Man, if God sees this, you know, what's going to be the, 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 the consequence of this sin if I do this? And so knowing that God is, that God knows all things, maybe it'll cause us to obey and, and not do the, the, the secret sin. So it's important to know our God. Why? Because Jesus says it is eternal life. So praise God for the study, brother, and, and God bless you. Beautiful. I thought I would bring up two things. Um, number one, we just mentioned about the secret sin. I was at a funeral yesterday for a man who passed away at a little past 68. And they're sharing his life testimony. Um, they said he was truck driving 
for overholster furniture out in Kansas. And he had not been following God. He had been straying and, and running away from God. When out of the blue, a storm came and there was, you know, thunder and lightning. And I guess this thunderbolt hit the ground next to his truck while he was driving. And it sounded like a cannon that went off. He thought his truck had been hit. And he thought he's going to open his eyes and he'd, he'd be gone. That would be it. And they said when he opened his eyes and realized that he was still alive, he pulled his truck over immediately, got out, got on his knees and told God, you got my attention. I'm, I'm coming back to you right now. I'm, I'm done with what I'm doing. I'm yours right now. And from then on, he lived, you know, to the best of his ability. They said he wasn't perfect, but he, he, he did get it. God got his attention. But I also noticed in Revelations 3, um, because everybody says, you know, well, God is all loving. So he won't send me to hell because he's all loving. But if you look at Revelations 3, God is a gentleman. And so I always turn it back and say, well, yeah, but if God is a gentleman, he stands at the door and knocks. He doesn't do ram and slam your door down and come in and say, look, you're an idiot. You need me. You just don't know it. He's very gentle when he does that. So why would a gentle God, a God who's a gentleman, want? why would he force you to be with him the rest of your life when you don't want him here on earth? And so, you know, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, you wouldn't want to be with somebody now. Why would you want to spend eternity with that's what loving God does is they get he says, okay, when you die, we'll make it permanent. So the question is, do you really want what you really want? And so I know that was probably another attribute you didn't get to, but I do like how our all powerful, all knowing God is a gentleman. He's, he's a caring father. He doesn't force himself on us, which it just makes me want to be a better father. So just to follow his example. The Apostle Paul said that we um, can call him Abba Father, which is which is like Daddy. So, you know, as uh, fathers, and when you're raising a young child, if you're raising them according to the Scriptures, one of the questions that that child can come up with is, "Well, who created God?" And children, and if the parent who is teaching the child through the scriptures isn't prepared to answer that, then they've got to do a little bit of homework on themselves, a little bit of study there. Because that is a question that has come up. Because with our natural mind, that's the first thing that we think of, that there has to be a beginning. God has to be a beginning, but he, he doesn't. He's eternal. He has always existed. Now that's by faith. That's where our faith comes in. So it's a, it's a great lesson for uh, men and women who have younger children who are raising them up in what is being taught in their Sunday schools. Amen. Brother Doyle, you want to close us up? Love to.